Welcome to the new section of the Cornell Emerging Markets Institute, where we brief you on the week's hot topics in emerging markets. We begin with the E20 country block, which is observing the largest foreign capital flight since the 2008 financial crisis. Companies have withdrawn more than $19 billion from emerging markets such as India, Indonesia, the Philippines, South Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand. Some attribute this to better yields in low-risk markets, as even Asian stocks are starting to underperform, and as Turkey, India, Indonesia, and Argentina raise interest rates to retain investors. But for now, Asian currencies still outperform other E20 countries in the money markets. Next, we turn to Nigeria, a country which, after having observed an economic recovery in the last two years, is now expected to stagnate in the next eight, according to recent studies. With an annual population growth of 2.6% and an expected marginal GDP increase of 2.1%, the IMF projects that Nigeria's GDP per capita is on course to drop in the years to come. The country has fallen behind in export complexity, a key indicator for GDP per capita. Petrodollars still account for 70% of the government's revenues, and experts argue that structural changes are needed to lift non-oil government revenues. To further impact this news, we welcome Olusei Shonaya. Olusei, thank you for being here. Yudis, thank you for having me. So what are the perspectives for uh, export, complexity, export complexity such as oil revenues? Hmm. This is a really good question. Uh, oil revenues have obviously dominated Nigeria's economic output for the last 40 to 50 years. However, we believe that there is tremendous inherent um, interest in uh, a variety of industries. The challenge has been infrastructural. Uh, a lot of industries are really hampered by the low electricity availability. So we think the government needs to make greater investments uh, in partnership with private industry to build out uh, the infrastructure in transportation, shipping, roads, and uh, again, especially electricity. And then we'll start to see that uh, export diversity. However, I should note that for non-tangible goods, especially digital exports such as Nigeria's film industry, uh, they're not being hampered as much. And so we're seeing them travel not only across the continent, but around the world. And what might we see from this political coalition in this process? Well, the current administration really um, targeted corruption as the linchpin of their policy platform. Their thesis was that corruption was the key and was the um, fundamental blockade that was hampering economic development. However, it seems like it's a little bit more complex than that. Mm. Some are arguing that this uh, corruption is deeply intertwined with um, uh, the economic incentive of certain special interests. Mm -hmm. So the policy might need to diversify a little bit, might need to broaden to try to realign the incentives of the parties. I argue the same exact parties. If you can get them to go from being at cross purposes with the Nigerian public to being aligned with the Nigerian public, we can see a significant turnaround. And uh, so this realignment, do you see a window of opportunity with this uptick in oil prices? I do think the uptick in oil prices is a boon for Nigeria because, again, our revenues are so heavily driven by oil. Uh, it gives more spending uh, capability to the government for capital expenditures. However, I don't think that it is uh, the end-all, be-all. I think that there needs to be some, again, um, partnership with private industry uh, and even international partners attracting some investment dollars externally uh, to help build out all these infrastructure. Well, thank you, Olusei. Thank you so much. Finally, we take you to India, which the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development recently invited to join as a shareholder, now the eighth member of the bank. This feat comes as India positions itself as an attractive international investment country in light of its efforts to diversify its economy and companies, and it spells increased access for the country to markets across Central Asia, Egypt, and Jordan. To further explain this development, we welcome Shruti Sudarsan. Shruti, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, Yudis. Uh, so what does this mean for India? Well, I think this is great news for India. Over the last 25 years, we've seen that India has followed this market-based model of development that the bank very much champions. So considering this and moving forward, I see 
I see this as a step forward in, strength, in strengthening the relationship between the bank and India. To date, the bank has already worked with leading Indian corporate groups such as Tata, Mahindra, and Jindal. And now that India is, has a membership in the EBRD, I can see the scope of these joint initiatives just being further enhanced. Mm. And so how, how do you see this partnership developing over the years? Well, I think that the EBRD will now be able to work a lot more closely with Indian companies in order to invest in new areas such as Central Asia, Egypt, and Jordan, as you had mentioned, um, especially considering that, as how India now has access to the EBRD's economic, political, and commercial expertise, I can see that India will be able to really take advantage of all of this knowledge. In addition to that, I also think that in terms of strengthening this relationship that we, we see here, um, both India and the EBRD have a shared pursuit of green energy finance. Mm. So the EBRD has really been promoting renewable energy in a lot of the areas that they invest in. And now with India in the picture, we can definitely see that India, be, the country will be taking a lot more um, of a proactive role in um, shaping the strategy even further. Well, that's it for us. We thank Shruti and Oli Shehi for their participation and you for watching. To find out more about Cornell's Emerging Markets Institute, visit our website. Until next time.